My name is Demelza Hayes. The first time I heard about Bitcoin, that was in 2013. I was working in India. I was studying there. My job there was to study basically microfinance. So they were giving loans to women, very small loans, like basically the equivalent of 20 euros. My job was to check if those women had repaid the loans, if they had defaulted, how did they invest the loans. You know, I was really astonished to find that there was women that were homeless, um, but they had smartphones, and they were able to basically save money on their phone with prepaid phone credits. I started Googling, how does this work? How, how do, this was in 2013, so I didn't, I'd never heard of Vodafone in Pesa before. Then I found out about Bitcoin online while I was researching microfinance, and at that time, Bitcoin was still being touted as a way to bank the world's unbanked, you know, and I think now we see that that's a little bit different because we have high transaction fees and Probably it's not designed um, well to be used to buy coffee, but now we have competitors coming in that are trying to meet meet that niche, that niche market that has uh, huge demand. You know, so I think um, yeah, that's basically how I got interested in Bitcoin originally, just how it could uh, provide financial services to people in in need. Bitcoin, in my opinion, at the current stage um, with, with the way that the uh, protocol works is basically digital gold. It does not have an elastic supply. The supply does not move in and out in response to demand shocks. So if all of a sudden the media starts reporting on Bitcoin and then everybody around uh, you know, Vienna starts buying Bitcoin, well then the supply of Bitcoin is still stable. You know, it's fixed. And so that new demand that's rushing in to buy Bitcoin pushes the price up. And then we have this problem where there's tons of vol volatility, right? There's lots of volatility with Bitcoin because it's not supply inelastic. And that's a really different from the current money that we have, fiat money, which is supply inelastic. I, for me, I think that, you know, based on Bitcoin's, you know, protocol um, and the distribution over time, it's, it's more like digital gold. Well, I think my sentiment changed a little bit because when I first heard about Bitcoin, I was so excited. Um, I actually did invest all of my money, all of my savings in Bitcoin. If I had invested in 2013, it would have been okay, but I, of course, didn't invest the first second I saw it. I invested about a year later when it was coming down off the, off the 1400 peak. So I invested in it when it was 1600 in like September 2014. And then, of course, the price dropped by 50% about three months later. So within three months, I'd lost like half of my savings. And then I was like, OK, I should probably research this and see if I just invested in a Ponzi scheme or what did I just invest in? And that's when I started actually every day learning about this technology. And uh, yeah, and, and over time, my views did change. I mean, now I have a much more um, wider view. I'm not so like dogmatic about Bitcoin. I'm not like, I'm not saying, oh, the block size has to be this way or, oh, the d developers, I'm, I'm only going to support a technology that's with this developer behind it. And, and I'm actually just looking more at like the long-term economic sustainability of these different models. Like is, is this one, you know, is the fee structure in Bitcoin really going to be the one that can survive in the long term? And, um, and then what I try to do is I try to back backtrack to today. So, okay, if we see fees going up in the future, what, what's going to happen to the price today? And uh, if, if there's more competitors coming out that are offering a way to solve some problems, you know, I'm, I'm trying to keep my radar, um, you know, trying to keep all these different coins on my radar so that if one does start to really attract market attention, um, I'm aware, I'm alert. I think in general, the, the overall idea I like decentralized finance. I like permissionless. You know, I like censorship resistance. You know, I like I like these these uh, these traits. And so overall, the overall idea is great. And uh, yeah, and I've I've just moved more towards towards kind of an open mind towards towards the space. Um, so the Crypto Research Report is a report that I write along with Mark Volick um, at Incrementum AG in Liechtenstein. It's um, basically the sister report to In Gold We Trust. So they've been producing a report on gold for the past 12 years. And I think, you know, the, the digital analog is crypto gold, you know, digital gold. And we, um, so we basically thought that we can add the same understanding of the monetary system to crypto. We can understand crypto 
within a framework of, of economics and macroeconomics. And uh, I'm coming more from the crypto side and Incrementum's coming more from the gold side. So we're able to basically combine um, our knowledge of these two asset classes in, in order to understand crypto more. It's available for free in German and, and in English. I'm actively publishing academic papers. Um, and so what I, you know, what I notice is that academic papers are often made for a very specific audience that's very deep into the topic. It's often not that well read. Like I have to admit, like academic papers get read by the people that review them, but once they're um, distributed to the community, it's not like every average person is going to read your paper. Um, so, what, so what I try to do is I try to take some of the insights from the data analysis that I use for those papers I break it down, I explain it in a way that somebody that's in the financial sector or somebody that's just in the average community, like a university student, um, could understand. And then we include like nice charts and uh, funny memes. We try our hardest to not put any biased, con I mean, like our own bias, you know, our own bias in there. And, uh, and we also don't allow any kind of like paid you know, subtle little, oh, by the way, this product over here, you know, you know, little uh, hidden advertisements. So we, we try to really keep it clean and, uh, and uh, qu high quality. There's a lot of technological changes occurring within the crypto space. It's moving so fast. Um, there's so much innovation. I mean, I'm really impressed by the decentralized finance movement. Basically, now you have smart contracts that allow people to use an asset that they already purchased, they allow, lock it up and then gain liquidity from that. You know, we have these collateralized loans now. Um, I think that soon enough we're going to have decentralized mortgage lending where people could lock up assets um, and basically earn interest on giving their collateral to someone who needs it at that moment. I think that this is huge. If, if, if I can lend money to people, that's a benefit for me because I earn interest. It's a benefit for them because they need capital. Um, and I think that these, you know, these, these platforms that are trying to build decentralized finance, like people, decentralized finance, ones that are trying to build uh, decentralized stable coins, you know, um, stable coins that have achieved stability with no counterparty risk. I mean, this is, this is really, I have to say, revolutionary. So I think that for, for, I mean, in my opinion, I think that, you know, the large fintech companies that are coming in, coming into the banking sector and saying, look, guys, um, the days of rent sinking are over. <laughs> you know, the days of just being able to have a network and some capital and uh, getting a big, uh, getting huge profits year after year after year, not, not ever offering people higher quality uh, products that they demand. Um, you know, th those, those days are coming to a, an end pretty quickly. And I think the fintech companies coming in, building, you know, decentralized finance, just faster, better products. You know, it's, it's, I think that's for, for the world, it's, it's going to be huge. That's the beauty of, of this technology because it can be regulated in the sense that if you want to comply, you, you can. But if you also want to not comply, they can't stop you. It has one foot in each space. It can be regulated. You can tick off all the boxes. Okay, I did KYC, I did AML, um, you know, I paid my taxes, whatever. You can tick off all the boxes. But on the other hand, if the people um, that, that are making the rules take advantage, you have an escape, right? You have an exit now. And I think that that simple exit option will make the people that make the rules behave. If the central banks and the treasuries and the government create environments that we want to live and work in, there's no problem. You know, there's no problem. Not a lot of people are going to use stuff that, that the government doesn't want us to use. Um, and it's only in the worst case scenarios where it's no longer an option to use the existing system that, that we could step out and, and use something that's, that's not regulated. Um, or, or semi-regulated. So I think that basically we just have competition and in the end competition brings higher quality. You know, I've, I've thought a lot about this and I think that you don't want to have your medium of exchange like your euro or your Swiss franc to be pegged to Bitcoin because Bitcoin is so volatile. And the goal of, of the medium of exchange like the euro or the Swiss franc is to basically have a stable unit of account where the purchasing power of that unit is 
through time, not increasing or decreasing in, in, in value. Um, and that really helps businesses, that helps producers um, to basically understand what consumer demand is based on prices. So prices are like these surrogates of information that transmit information about consumer demand to the producers so that if the price goes up of milk, the, the producer can say, I guess that means that the demand for milk is going up, so I should buy another cow. You know, And then they, they go back one step and they buy another cow and they bid up the resources that are required to produce another liter of milk. Um, and you know, I think that we need that stable unit of account so that the producers can adequately um, meet consumer demand. And I think that we don't want, that's why I don't think we want to peg it to Bitcoin necessarily, but I do think um, if we just look in history, there's tons of research on this topic. So there's uh, Irving Fisher, uh, he was a uh, 19th cen uh, 20th century economist, early, early uh, uh, 1900s, and he wrote a paper where, you know, you don't, peg the currency to a physical unit of gold, but you peg it to basically a variable amount of gold. So whenever I want to redeem my currency, I can redeem it for a variable amount of gold so that I don't have this, this huge uh, deflationary pressure where, where it's always, uh, the prices are always changing. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm publishing a paper on this uh, shortly, basically, where I try to explain uh, how I think how I think a you know, decentralized financial system could work. Um, but I do think cryptocurrencies will make, play a major role in that. Um, I'm just not, uh, I'm not sure it's gonna be the current, the current incumbent cryptocurrencies. Um, and I'm not sure that uh, it's going to be exactly the way people might think about it where it's directly backed or pegged or anything like that. I think we're gonna have a space of lots of competition lots of different monetary experiments and monetary policy um, and the market's going to be choosing winners and losers and I think that uh, over time we're going to see see certain business models attracting more more customers than others yeah